stupid myself. I really don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm not going to tell Brother Martin anything else because everything I tell him, he always gets me to tell you. Amen. And what I was doing is, is the other night, last night, I was out talking with Brother Jim here and I said, now, you know, I get it. He was talking about college and about the job that he had and without more college and more training, he'd probably never be able to get any better of a job than what he had. And I said, well, forget about the college because, you know, these guys coming out of college today, they're not smart. I said, as a matter of fact, one of the things that happens to them when they go to college is they lose their ability to reason. Now, I didn't even finish high school. I went into the service and took a GED test, and I got my last year in five hours. And uh, that was just, uh, well, I, I guess I could say luck then because I was lost, but I guess it was providence or something. And uh, when it comes to education, I don't have any education. I went to Bible school for three years, and I learned some Bible, and that's, uh, that's about all the education I have. But um, every now and then we go to UC and to the university over at Oxford and get a chance to deal with these young people. Well, you know, they're real proud, and before you can ever give them anything, you've got to humble them a little bit. And one of the first things they'll do is they'll spout off and they'll say, well, that Bible you have was just written by man. And that's not the Word of God. It's just a book written by man. And I say, oh, it is, huh? And they say, yeah, it, it is. And I say, well, uh, you believe in the system of jurisprudence, don't you? And they say, what? <laughs> and I said, you don't know what I'm talking about? you college man, and you don't know about the system of jurisprudence? And they sort of said, well, uh, you know, and stumble. I said, well, you know, that's uh, a person in our country is... Uh, he's innocent until they take him into a court and prove him guilty. I said, you believe in that kind of a system, don't you? And they say, well, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, the same thing holds true with the Word of God. Uh, this book claims to be the Word of God. Now, it's innocent until you can prove it to be guilty. And then I hand them my Bible and I say, here, can you prove this book's not the Word of God? <laughs> and they say, well... Um, I heard that uh, there's contradictions in that. But I said, well, come on, man. Uh, I'm not going to just take what you hear. You're an educated fella. Come on, show me something. And uh, they can't do it. And then I say to them, well, um, uh, do you uh, know anything about compound probabilities? <laughs> and they say, what? <laughs> and I said, what are you learning up here in this college anyway, you know? Uh, you don't know about compound probabilities, how that uh, when you uh, state that something's going to happen and each time you put a detail to it, it increases the odds. And, uh, if you, uh, and then I give them a little illustration there that I read out of the front of Larkin's book about, you know, he said if I would predict that there was an earthquake going to take place in Philadelphia, he said the chances of that happening are one in two. He said if I predict that it'll take place in Philadelphia on the 4th of July, the chances increase to one to four. And then he said, for every detail that's added, the odds increase. And then I point out the fact that in the Word of God, Jesus Christ, uh, there's 25 different things that are prophesied about the Lord Jesus Christ that take place in a 24-hour period. And these things were prophesied 500 to 1,000 years before the one man ever even showed up on the face of the earth. And I say, do you know what the odds of that happening are? It's 1 in 33,556,000, uh, whatever it is, you know, and I've got it written out in the front of my Bible. I said, now, uh, you know, can you show me another book that uh, can do something like that? <laughs> and by the time they hear a few things like that, you know, they don't have quite as much pride and, and they're ready to listen and then uh, you can do something with them. And, and so uh, when I go, you know, to a, a college campus or around college people, I, I realize that uh, they might be able to get me when it comes to physics and science and things like that that they've been studying. But when it comes to this book, uh, they've lost their ability to reason. They, they accept facts as true without ever uh, searching it out, without ever uh, delving into it and finding out the other side of the story. And of course, uh, most of them believe in evolution. And so I usually go pretty well stocked up on my uh, stuff on evolution and then uh, they've never heard the other side you know they, they've just heard the different theories that are being taught in that college and uh, I, one of the things that I like to ask them is well you believe in the theory of evolution 
then uh, why isn't there uh, more species of these in, uh, evolved beings, the, these beings in a, a transition stage? Why do they only have the jawbone of the Piltdown man and the, uh, the tooth of a Java man that's been found out to be... I said, why aren't there whole civilizations of these people that are, are in this state of evolution? And, uh, you know, they don't have an answer for that. And then I ask them, if evolution is true, and if people are still in, evolving today, then where does that put the colored fella? <laughs> gives him something. Hey, man. <laughs> Everybody's leaving. What's everybody walking out for? My wife walked out. Somebody else walked out. What's going on here? Hey, come on back in here. The preaching's just getting ready to stuff. <laughs> All right, take your Bibles tonight and turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and... You know, in the, the week and a couple of days that I've been here, I guess I've covered a, a multitude of topics and a multitude of subjects. But tonight, this is one of my favorite. And I like to preach about the Lord coming back, but, and I know He's coming back. And uh, tonight, I just want to preach a message to you that I've entitled, Jesus is Mine. You know, I'm thankful for what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me, and uh, He's mine tonight. And if you're saved, he's yours tonight. If you're not saved, he's not yours. And what you need to do is get saved, and then you can go out of here and say, Jesus is mine. Amen. Amen. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. It says in verse 8, The voice of my beloved, Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. It says there that my beloved is coming. One of these days, uh, he's going to come back. One of these days, he's going to show up and come back to this earth and when he comes back, he's going to get me. It says there, my beloved's coming. Verse 9, it says, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. You know something? My beloved's watching tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ knows what's going on. His eyes, the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding both the good and evil. Brother, the Bible says he's watching. In verse 10, it says, My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is over and gone, and the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. It says, My beloved's going to call me. One of these days, that trump's going to sound, and the voice of the archangel's going to uh, go off, and I'm going to be called up to be with him. He's going to call. It says there in verse... Um, 13, the fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with her tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rocks, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies until the day break, and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of the bether. It says there in verse 16, My beloved is mine, and I am his. And that's what I want to preach to you on tonight. Jesus is mine. Jesus is the beloved. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, we're thankful that we can be here again. Lord, we're thankful for all the things that you've done for us. Lord, I'm thankful for every song that's been sung tonight. And Lord, uh, I'm thankful for the special song that was sung tonight about uh, having an anchor in these uh, kind of times. And Lord, tonight I know that the only anchor that will hold, the only rock that won't sink is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, tonight if there's someone in here that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that this would be the night that they would trust you and come to know you in a personal way. Father, if there's some Christian in here that the devil has been uh, bombarding with doubts, Lord, I pray tonight they'd be able to go out of here with the assurance in their heart that Jesus Christ is theirs. Father, I pray tonight that you would just take this message and empower it and God anoint it from on high and use it for your honor and glory. Lord, I confess to you tonight that there's nothing that I can do. God, I have no ability to uh, do anything in the flesh. Lord, if you don't uh, give me the thoughts to say, my mind won't uh, conjure them up. Lord, if you don't uh, enable my tongue to speak, then, Lord, uh, I'll be all tongue-tied and defoe. Father, if you don't do the work in this uh, audience tonight, then nothing will be accomplished. 
And Lord, we're looking to you. We commit it all to you. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit of God would be here with great convicting power and that, Lord, tonight we would go out of here having uh, experienced the manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God amongst us. And, Lord, we'll give you all the thanks and the glory and praise for all that you do and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Now, you know, uh, you'll never have assurance of your salvation until you come to the place in your life where you can say, Jesus is mine, my beloved is mine, and I am his. We sing a song, I haven't heard it sung this week, but uh, I've heard it sung many times, I've sung it many times, and the song is, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Brother, I'll tell you what, when you have that blessed assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ is yours and you belong to Him, then you know what that is? That's a little foretaste of glory divine. I'm thankful tonight that I can say, My beloved is mine and I am His. I'm thankful tonight that Jesus Christ is mine. He's my possession. Twelve years ago on the street corner, He saved my soul. He's been with me ever since. He's mine. He's my possession. He's my personal possession. He's my prized possession. In other words, I I wouldn't give anything that I've got in exchange for the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. I'm thankful for Him and I'm thankful that I can say my beloved is mine. But do you know the devil works in the realm of doubt? And I never doubted my salvation before I got saved. Never had one doubt about it because I didn't have anything to doubt. A lost man doesn't doubt his salvation. A lost man's on his way to hell and he knows that. His heart tells him that he's hell bound. Brother, I'll tell you what, after a person gets saved, the devil has the ability to come around and inject doubt into the heart of the child of God. Now, there's a lot of people that go through life and they never doubt their salvation. That's great. That's wonderful. But then there's people in this life that do have a lot of doubt about it. And brother, I'll tell you what, until you can come to the place where you say Jesus is mine, you know something, the devil's going to be able to bombard you with some kind of a doubt. Down in Dyersburg, Tennessee, I preached a meeting down there. There was a lady that came forward one night and uh, she prayed, hung around after the meeting was over. The preacher said, you go deal with her. You talk to her. I've talked to her before. And I went over there and I said, what's the problem, young lady? And she said, I don't know whether I'm saved. And I took the Bible and showed her the Bible. She said, I've seen all that. She said, I've been forward eight times. And the last time was down in Myrtle, Mississippi. She said, eight times I've walked down an aisle. Eight times I've had somebody show me the Bible. Eight times I've prayed and asked Jesus to save me. She said, five of the times I followed the Lord in baptism, having thought that I was saved every time, only to be convinced by the devil or by whatever that she was lost. And I said to her, well, listen, if you've already seen the Scriptures, if you've already done what the Word of God tells you to do, then there's nothing more to do. And she looked at me, she said, what do you mean? I said, just what I said. You trust the Word of God. You trust the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, if you were sincere and you met business with God, it's bound to have taken one of them times. <laughs> and the preacher, he sort of laughed when he heard what I said there. And he said, McDowell, you're no good, man. That woman's troubled about her soul. I said, what can I do? Eight times she's called on the Lord and asked her, uh, uh, the Lord to save her. I said, it's bound to have happened one of them times. Amen. You know something? There's a lot of people that go through life and they never have the assurance of where they're going to go when they die. And brother, that is pathetic and that is tragic and God doesn't want anyone to live like that. You ought to be able to go out of here tonight and say, Jesus is mine and I am His. You ought to be able to say, my beloved is mine and I am His. I remember hearing a preacher preach one time and he was a great preacher. He said, there's not one day that doesn't go by that the devil doesn't tell me that I'm lost. In other words, the devil came to him constantly and tried to convince him that he wasn't really saved. I remember reading about a, an incident during the First World War when the soldiers would be replaced. The front-line soldiers would be marking, marching back to the back line and the replacements would be coming up. And as they would cross each other, uh, pass each other on the road, they would try to shout words of encouragement back and forth to one another. And the frontline soldiers that were going to the rear, they would say to the ones that were coming up, they would say, 196, boys, 196. And the little hymnal that was issued to the soldiers back during the First World War, 196, was God be with you till we meet again. And the fellows that were going up to the front line, they would answer back and say, four further on, boys, four further on. And four further on was page 200. 
and that was blessed assurance Jesus is mine. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, when you're going into battle, you better know Jesus Christ is yours, and there's a battle going on tonight. There's a spiritual warfare that's taking place, and as a child of God, you better know that you're saved, and better know that you're heaven-bound. You better have assurance tonight of your salvation. About a year ago, a couple popes died. And uh, those popes died, and you know something is... Uh, the world mourned their death. I didn't mourn it, but uh, a lot of the world mourned their death. All kinds of things were said. But do you realize that not one time did any church official say those popes died and went to heaven? Not one time did any layman from the Catholic Church say that those popes died and went to heaven. Not one time did any newspaper reporter say that those popes died and went to heaven. As a matter of fact, the stories that came out was how shocking, how tragic that this has taken place. Catholic churches all over the world were having masses and offering up prayers for the souls of those two men that died. Brother, I'll tell you what, when death comes, it's too late to pray. It's too late to do anything. One newspaper reporter did say, he was such a good man, I hope he went to heaven. <laughs> Well, brother, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to die in that kind of condition. Here's a man that claims to be the vicar of Christ, the representative of Jesus Christ on this earth, and when he dies, nobody knows where he went. Brother, I'll tell you what, that's pathetic, that's tragic, and that's not the way God wants people to live. Brother, that Bible says over and over again, you can know that you're saved. First John chapter 5, in verse 11, it says... Uh, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Brother, if you have the Son tonight, you have life. If you don't have Jesus Christ tonight, you don't have life. If you can go out of here and say Jesus is mine, then you have eternal life. And if you can't say that from the heart, knowing that He dwells within, then you're lost, and you can't say Jesus is mine. And it says in that 13th verse, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God doesn't want you to guess about it. God doesn't want you to hope about it. God doesn't want you to go through life wondering about it. He wants you to know where you're going when you die. That Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul writing to the converts there, he says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, and ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. He said when the word of God came to you, it didn't just come in word, brother, it came in power, it came accompanied by the Holy Ghost of God, and it came with much assurance. Brother, when people sit under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and give their heart to Jesus Christ, they go away with assurance and they know that something's taking place. They might not be able to show it to you in the Bible. They might not all know all the theology about it. They might not know about the doctrine of eternal security. But brother, they know something's taking place in their heart life. They know that they've been born again of the Spirit of God. And if you can sit here tonight and not know that you've been saved, then chances are you just need to come and get saved. But brother, there was a time you knew you got saved, and now the devil has come and injected doubt into your heart. I've got good news for you tonight. Jesus wants you to be able to go out here and say, He's mine. Hallelujah, He's mine. You know, some I hope that I never have a ministry that causes people to doubt. That brother the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I believe if a man's putting out the Word of God, it's going to minister faith to the hearers and not doubt to the hearers. But you know what you have today? A bunch of preachers that can't get lost people to come in and hear them preach. So they're trying to convince the saved people that they're lost and they need to be saved. And brother, churches all over the United States tonight, I mean, they'll have their revival meetings. They'll have church on Sunday. The preacher will get up and he'll preach about the foolish virgins and the wise virgins and say they were church members that didn't have any oil. Amen. And just convince half of them that because Jesus Christ isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And convince them that brother, if they don't live exactly the way he says they should live, they never really got saved. And brother, I believe tonight that that's a bunch of baloney. I believe tonight that that's a ministry that provokes doubt into the heart of a child of God. I know when a person gets saved, his life might not be exactly what it ought to be all the time, but that doesn't mean that he was lost. I say to you tonight that God wants you to know you're saved. He wants you to have assurance of your salvation. Isaiah 32, verse 17. 
It says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Brother, I believe you can have assurance tonight. Take your Bible. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews is the book that everybody takes you to to try to convince you that you can lose your salvation. But you know, right there in the 10th chapter of Hebrews is one of the strongest, uh, strongest uh, passages in the Word of God on the fact that you can't lose your salvation. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Brother, that Bible says you hold fast to your profession without wavering because he is faithful that promised. And if you're resting on the promises of God tonight, if you came to the Lord Jesus Christ because you heard that he promised to give eternal life to anyone that would come and you came as a sinner, don't ever let the devil take and rob that profession from you. And it's happening today. But then on the other hand, don't be fooled into thinking because you had some kind of a religious experience that that's salvation. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says in verse 5, you say, well, what are you preaching like this for? Because Paul says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Paul, writing to a carnal church, he said to that carnal church, Brother, some of you don't have any fruit. Some of you I'm leery about. Some of you I'm wondering about. You better examine yourselves. You know what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10? He says, You make your calling and election sure. There's one thing that everybody ought to do in some time in their life, and that's look into their heart and make sure that there was a time when they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ by faith as their Savior. And if you've done that, you can go out of here tonight and say, Jesus is mine. I want to say three things about assurance of salvation tonight. And the first thing I want to say is it's important that you have assurance. You know, if you don't have assurance of your salvation, you'll never be any good as a soldier. How are you going to stand and fight a spiritual warfare? How are you going to stand in the face of the enemy and fight if you don't know in your heart where you're going when you die? You can't. Brother, the reason why there's a lot of Christians not on the firing line and not fighting with this fight of pain because the devil came around and put doubt in their heart and mind as to whether they really got saved. Amen. Some years back, one of the largest bridges that was ever built was under construction, the Golden Gate Bridge in California. It took $77 million to build that bridge. As those men were working on the bridge, they started slipping and falling. Twenty-three men went to their death before that bridge was half complete. And of course, production cut down. Fellows got scared. They got careful because they knew maybe they would be the next ones to plunge to their death. The company got together and decided that there was only one thing to do, and that was to construct a safety net. It cost them $100,000 to build that net. But the second part of the bridge, as it was under construction, uh, ten men fell and not one of them was hurt. The uh, work uh, production increased 25%. And that bridge was completed by men who didn't fear to go out there because they knew that underneath was a net that would catch them if they fall and they could do their work without having fear of dropping to their death. You know something tonight I'm trying to tell you that as a soldier, as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never be able to stand and fight until you know that if you died in the battle, died in the warfare, Jesus Christ would be there, that you're His and He's yours and that you're going to heaven when you die. You'll never be a good soldier until you have that knowledge, until you have that peace. You know something to, have a, to be a good soldier, the Bible says you have to have armor. And one of the armor, pieces of armor that a Christian must have is the helmet of salvation. Now you know the head's important. And if you go into war, brother, you get shot in the head, chances are you're done. 
And that Bible says that on your head, you're supposed to have the helmet of salvation. In other words, every day when you get up to go out and face uh, the spiritual warfare that you have to face, you better put on the helmet of salvation. The foremost thing on your mind ought to be the fact that there was a time in your life when you became a child of God, and as you live in this world, you don't live like the rest of the world, because now you're a child of the King, and you've got the helmet of salvation on your head. That ought to be one of the foremost things on your mind as you enter into combat. Helmet of salvation. That Bible says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. And I'm thankful that I can go back to the time in my life when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior and I know and have assurance in my heart tonight that, brother, I did the right thing. And that's what you need if you don't have it. You know, you'll never have any joy till you have assurance of your salvation. You know, the people that are happy tonight, the people that know where they're going when they die, a fellow said one time that joy is the flag which is flown from the uh, castle of the heart when the king is in residence. Brother, I'll tell you what, tonight i got joy in my heart because I've got something to rejoice about. You say, what do you have to rejoice about? Him. I can rejoice because Jesus is mine and I'm His. You know something? Jesus is my Savior. He saved me. I know when He saved me. Brother, I didn't know all about it at the time, but I knew as I stood there on that street corner and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart, when I raised my head up and looked at that street and looked at those bars across that street, I knew that something supernatural had taken place in my life. He said, did you have some kind of feeling? Brother, the only feeling I had was a feeling that 24 years of sin and guilt and ungodliness had been lifted off of me and I felt clean and I felt free and I felt like a baby for the first time in my life. And brother, I'll tell you what, I've been free ever since that time. Yeah. I haven't been in bondage to the uh, to religion. I haven't been in bondage to the devil. And the times that I've messed up and failed my Lord was because I did it willfully and purposely and brother, it bothers me every time I do. I'm telling you tonight that you need to know you have a Savior, and if you know that, you can rejoice. Amen. Not only do I have a Savior, but I've got a shepherd. He not only saves me, but he leads me. Amen. Amen. Brother, as I go through this life, I don't know where all the curves are. I don't know where all the valleys are. I don't know where all the pitfalls are. I don't know where all the trouble is going to be. But, brother, I've got a Savior and I've got a shepherd that leads me. You know, you don't drive sheep, you drive cattle. You lead sheep. And if you're a sheep tonight, you ought to be able to rejoice in the fact that you've got a shepherd. Amen? That shepherd will lead you in the paths of righteousness. The Bible says if you're a son of God, you'll be led by the Spirit of God. And brother, I'll tell you what, there might be some times in your life where you have to wait. There might be some times in your life where you drag behind and the Lord has to whip you a little bit. There may be some times in your life where you try to run ahead and He has to pull you back and set you back a little bit. But you ought to be able to rejoice tonight and say that I've got a shepherd that leads me. Not only that, I've got a supplier that feeds me. Amen. When I get hungry, I've got food because I've got somebody to supply my needs. Now, I'm not just talking about physical food. I'm talking about spiritual food. Brother, I'll tell you what, the Lord won't leave you empty. He won't leave you starved to death, whether it be spiritually or physically. I believe God is able to supply every need. I can rejoice tonight because i got a shield. i got somebody that protects me. Don't have to worry about harm. Don't have to worry about danger because there's a shield there that protects me. And not only that, I've got a sin bearer that cleanses me. When I get dirty, when I get sin in my life, when there's something that I do that's wrong and the Holy Spirit convicts me of it, then brother, I've got some place I can go to. I can go to the Lord Jesus Christ and confess my sins. And that's why he says, I have his boldness to enter into the holiness, uh, holy of holies through the blood of Jesus Christ. He takes that blood, he cleanses me, and he says, now you can enter into the holy of holies. And he says, when you come in, you can come in boldly. You know something? In the Old Testament, a person couldn't go into the holy of holies. I mean, there was a veil there. There was a petition there. And no one dared go in there except for the high priest. And he only went in there once a year. And brother, when he went in, he better have the right sacrifice when he went through there. 
But you know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil was rent in twain, and now the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a man from all sin, and he can go into that holy of holies up there. He can go into the presence, into the throne room of God, and go in there boldly, and make requests before God, and the Bible says that God will hear, that God will answer, that God will supply, that God will give grace in the time of need. Brother, I'm thankful tonight I've got a sin bearer. You know something? I can rejoice tonight. I've got joy in my heart because Jesus is mine. Not only that, but if you don't have assurance of your salvation tonight, if you can't say Jesus is mine, you'll go through life calling God a liar. And brother, I'll tell you what, that's a serious thing. You know all these people that believe you can lose your salvation. And I don't know who's in here tonight. Maybe you believe that in here tonight. But you know if you believe that you can lose your salvation, you know what you do? You call God a liar. You say, oh, oh now wait a minute, Brother McGow. I'd never call God a liar. If you believe you can lose salvation, you call God a liar. You say, prove that to me. Well, John 3 and verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath, right now, hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him right now. Present tense. That Bible says, if a man believes on Jesus Christ, then he has the Son. I have the Son because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then wrath abides on you present tense. And if you say you can lose eternal life, everlasting life that God gave you and that you have right now, if you can lose that, you call God a liar. John chapter 5 verse 24. Very simple verse says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Brother, I'll tell you what. If you have everlasting life, then how long is it going to last? Is it going to end tomorrow? If it's everlasting, is it going to end next week? If it's everlasting and eternal life, isn't it going to go on forever and ever and ever and ever? You say, yes, but it's conditional. No, it's not. It says if you believe, you've got it. If you don't believe, you don't have it. I remember the fellow that led me to the Lord. I asked him one time, I said, Bob, do you ever have any doubts about your salvation? He said, yeah. He said, there was a time in my life, a period in my life, when I had a lot of doubt about my salvation. And he said, I kept going back to the Bible, kept going back to the book. And he said, I finally realized that every time I let the devil cause me doubt, I was just making a liar out of God. And he said, I saw the ugliness of that sin and the awfulness of that sin. And he said, I repented of that sin and I determined in my heart I was never going to commit that sin again. And he said, I rested on the Word of God. And brother, he said, I haven't had any doubts since that day. If you believe that you can lose salvation, then you're calling God a liar. See, you need to know that you're saved. Have assurance of salvation. And if you don't know that, then you're making a liar out of God. John chapter 6, verse 37. It says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. A man comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, and brother, I'll tell you what, it says, If the Father gives him to me, he'll come to me, and if he comes to me, I'll in no wise cast him out. Woman, one time I was preaching in a church down in Dayton, Kentucky, and she came down the aisle, and uh, she said, I want to be saved. She had been sitting in church for about six months, under conviction many times, and finally one morning she came down to the aisle. I took her in the back room. And she prayed, she called on the Lord and asked the Lord to come into her heart. She was weeping and crying. And, and Brother, uh, I, I said to her afterwards, I said, Well, are you saved? And she said, I don't know. She said, I hope I am. She said, I think I am. She said, I've done uh, what I think is the right thing to do. But she said, I, I really don't know. And I showed her that verse. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I shall in no wise cast out. I said, who did you come to this morning? I said, did you come to the church? Did you come to me? Or did you come to Jesus? She said, well, I came to Jesus. And I said, well, then can he cast me out? And she got a big old smile on her face, and she said, no, he can't cast me out. And brother, she went out of that place rejoicing. I didn't give her assurance of her salvation. The Word of God gave her assurance of her salvation. And I say to you tonight, you need to know that Jesus is yours. If God says you're saved, then it doesn't matter how you feel. 
If God says you're saved, it doesn't matter what the devil says. If God says you're saved, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. Brother, if God says it, that's it. I remember the story about the little boy that was out fishing in the boat, you know, on the lake, and the storm came up and the boat overturned, and he finally swam to a rock, and it was late in the evening, and the darkness set in. They looked for the boy and couldn't find him, and he stayed on Live in constant fear of going out into eternity and then not making heaven. I've heard people say, I don't care about the judgment seat of Christ. I'll be happy if I just make it. <laughs> well, brother, I wouldn't want to go through life with that attitude. I know that I'm going to make it and I know there's a judgment seat of Christ up there and I know that all my life is going to be brought forth and manifested in a day and it's going to be tried by fire. And I say to you tonight that if you don't know that you're saved, if you can't go out of here saying Jesus is mine, you'll live in constant fear. I remember the story of the old lady that was crossing the Great Lakes and uh, she left uh, Buffalo, New York and she was going to uh, a Cleveland, Ohio to see her daughter and a storm came up there on the lake and the boat started pitching back and forth and, and people started getting scared and they started gathering on the deck of the boat to pray and ask God to, uh, to calm that storm there and there was one lady that uh, she wasn't scared she was going around that deck of that ship as it was going back and forth she was just whistling and singing and praising the Lord and finally the, the storm settled and calmed and a bunch of people went to her and said, Man, man, we were watching you. And when we saw you out there in the midst of that storm, you weren't afraid, you were whistling, you were happy. What's your secret? And she said, Well, my secret's this. She said, I've got two daughters. And some years ago, one daughter died and went to be with the Lord. And the other daughter moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And she said, I was going to see the one in Cleveland, Ohio. But then when the storm came up, I didn't know whether I was going to make it to Cleveland, Ohio, and I didn't know whether I'd see the one in heaven first or the one in Cleveland first, but it didn't make any difference to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what that is? That's assurance, brother. Yeah. She knew where she was going. She could say, Jesus is mine. One time there was a Scottish soldier that was wounded, and he had a bad wound, and the doctor came in, and was a Christian doctor. He said, son, I've got to operate right away. He said, I must warn you. He said, if I operate, the chances of you pulling through are 100 to 1. And he said, if I don't operate, you've only got a few hours to live. And the boy said, well, get on with it, Doc. And the doctor said, aren't you worried? And he said, get on with it, Doc. He said, well, aren't you scared? And he said, listen, Doc. He said, if I make it through, my mama's going to be standing by my bed to welcome me. And he said, if I don't make it through, and I come out on the other side, Jesus is going to be there with all the host of heaven to welcome me. And he says, I don't care which one welcomes me. You know what that is? That's a sure. And brother, I'll tell you why. Now, God doesn't want a man to go through life having doubts and fears as to where he's going to spend eternity. You ought to know that you're saved tonight. You ought to be able to go out of here and say, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And let me say this tonight. It's important that you know where you're going and have assurance of your salvation because you'll never grow in grace until you know that. The reason why a lot of people never witness is because they don't, they don't have assurance themselves. The reason why a lot of people never grow, I mean, they just come to a certain place in their life and then they sort of uh, dwarf right there. They, they're midgets. They never uh, mature into adult mature Christians. And a lot of times it's because the devil robs them of that assurance that they're going to heaven when they die. Brother, if the devil can get that out of you, if the devil can cause you to doubt, he can cause you to be so miserable, and you'll come, and you'll wonder, and you'll hope, and you'll go home, and you'll pray, and you'll turn and toss in your bed, and you'll kick the sheets. And brother, I'll tell you what, there's got to come a time in your life where you drive down the peg, and you say, this is it. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust the Word. I'm going to believe what that book says, and nothing else. It. And then you'll start to grow in grace. The next thing I want to say about assurance tonight is there's some things that cause a person to lack assurance. Maybe at one time you had assurance and maybe tonight you're not so sure. Bob Jones Sr. said, the root of every doubt is sin. One of the things that will cause a person to doubt their salvation and to doubt 
if they ever really got saved is for them to get saved and then turn their back on God. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ and then you don't fail to follow Him and live for Him and serve Him. And you turn your back on Him and you go back out into this ungodly world and you live like a lost man for about six months and you know what's going to happen? Somebody will come to you and say, Hey, I thought you got saved one time. And you're liable to do like a lot of people that I've talked to and say, Well, I was saved once, but I'm not saved now. But I'll tell you what, sin will cause you to doubt. Revelation chapter 2, there's a church there. And God says to that church, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works. Brother, if you got away from God tonight, if your life is filled with sin, if you've gone back to the old world and lived the old life, and tonight you're sitting in this building and the devil is telling you you never really got saved, but I'll tell you what, if you just repent and get your heart right and get the sin cleaned up in your life and come back into the first work, I believe God will put that blessed assurance in your heart. See, at the end of every doubt or sin, you just truck away from God. You just turn your back on Him and see how long your peace and your joy and your assurance lasts. It won't last too long. There's a lot of people who keep on going and going and going and get deeper and deeper in sin. And finally, as the time goes, their salvation gets real fuzzy. And pretty soon they don't know whether they're saved or whether they're lost. I say to you, sin, sinful living, will cause you to a lack of assurance of your salvation. You know, there's another thing that causes a person to lack assurance of their salvation, and that's a false idea of the Christian life. A false idea of what a Christian life is. There's a lot of people that think that if they mess up one time, that's it. They're done. Uh, there, there's uh, different religious beliefs that, that teach that a man can fall from grace. You know, there's no place in the Word of God that says that a man can fall from grace. No place in the Word of God that says that. You say, what about Galatians chapter 4? Galatians chapter 4 is talking about a man that's trying to be justified by the law. And if he's trying to be justified by the law, it says that he's fallen from grace. Yeah. It doesn't say he was in grace and fell out of grace. It says that because he's trying to justify himself by the law, he's never gotten in by grace. He's fallen from grace. But there's no violation in the Bible that says a man can be in grace one day and out of grace the next day. A man can't fall from grace. You know, uh, there's people that have false ideas about the Christian life. And they think if they mess up once, that's it. They must not have really been saved. You know what that Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16? For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. A just man, he'll fall, but he'll get up again. I say to you tonight, a saved man might fall, but he'll get up again. I've got a little girl. She's eight months old. And if some of you haven't seen her yet, you stick around there to the service and you watch her. She's been walking for about a month. She was an early walker. But you know something? Uh, we were talking about it last night, Brother Bud or, or Brother Harold, Brother Irving, one of us. We were watching her. She's only eight months old. You know what she'll do? She'll get up and she'll walk. And she'll walk a few steps like that and then she'll take a few steps back and catch her balance and she'll start going again and she'll plop down on, the, on her rear end, you know? But she doesn't stay down. Right. She doesn't stay out one minute. She turns right over. She grabs a hold of something, pulls herself up again, and she starts going again. You know, I couldn't tell you the number of times that little girl falls in the course of the day. But she gets up and goes again. You know, that's the way a Christian will do. Well, I'll tell you what, that Bible never says that when you get saved, your old nature is going to be eradicated. It never says that you're going to come to a place where you'll cease from sin. It never says that, brother, the old man will never give you any problem. As a matter of fact, Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? For in my mind, I serve the law of God, but with my flesh will all sin. He says, for I know, it's in that, uh, for I know that uh, in me that is in my flesh well of no good thing. Oh, Paul says, when I do good, evil is present with me. He says, uh, uh, the good that I would, I do not, and the, the evil that I would not, he says, that I do. Oh, Paul was a schizo. He says, I've got this old man, and he said, this old man just gives me fits. And brother, I'll tell you what, that Bible says that you're going to have to 
to mortify the deeds of the flesh. It says that you're not to get into the flesh. It says you're not to make any provision for the flesh. That Bible says, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But here comes a man, he gets saved, instead of walking in the Spirit and growing in grace, he goes back to the world, he follows after the flesh, he feeds the flesh, and brother, six months later, he doesn't know whether he's saved or lost. And somebody convinces him that he never really got saved because he had a false idea of the Christian life. The Christian life is that you do not get saved and cease from sin and just do everything right the rest of your life. Uh -uh. Well, that Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Brother, I'll tell you what, there's going to be times in your life where you will fail the Lord miserably and he'll take his belt off and he'll give you a whipping, but that's because he wants you to get up and go again. And the people that the devil whips are the ones that he can get down and they never get back up. And then he can convince them they were never really saved. False idea of a Christian life will mess you up. Neglect of your Christian duty will cause you to have doubts about your salvation. You know something? I believe that God leaves us here to save people for a reason. I believe God leaves us here to work. I told you the other night that Bible says we're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good work. I don't believe that God gives a man a license to sin after he gets saved. I believe God wants you to do some work. You say, what does God want me to do? I don't know what He wants you to do. I know what He wants me to do. And sometimes I wonder about that. But brother, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm not going to be a spiritual advisor to anybody and tell somebody what God wants them to do in this life. I believe if they'll pray and read the Bible and stay on their knees and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God will show them what He wants for their life. The will of God found in Romans chapter 12. If you want to know the will of God for your life, you keep studying Romans chapter 12 until God shows it to you. But that, that Bible says uh, that, that, that there's three wills. Uh, uh, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Brother, you can be in the good will of God, the acceptable will of God, and the perfect will of God. And if you'll read down through that chapter, I believe God can show you His perfect will for your life. But when you neglect your Christian duty, when you neglect to read the Word of God, when you neglect to assemble yourself together with Christians, when you neglect to, to, to pass out tracts and to witness, when you neglect to pray, when you neglect to be the Christian you ought to be, then you know what happens? The devil starts injecting doubts into your heart and mind about your salvation. I can say tonight, Jesus is mine. Can you? Let me ask you this tonight. Do you know, if you were to die right now, you'd go to be with the Lord. God wants you to know that. There's another cause for lack of salvation, lack of assurance rather, and that's ignorance of the Word of God. There's some people that always are worrying and always are wondering because they never really get into the book and find out what God says about it. I gave you a few little light verses on, on believing and things like that from the book of John. That's good. I mean, you can drive a stake down on those. Those are as good as any other verses. But you know, there's more than just that in the Word of God. You know what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30? It says, And grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed till the day of redemption. The Spirit of God sealed me. You say, how long has He sealed you for? Till the day of redemption. You say, when's the day of redemption? Well, redemption is to buy something back. If you go down to the pawn shop and you hop your watch, they'll give you a redemption slip. And brother, for you to get that watch back, you have to go with the money and the slip. If you don't have the slip, you don't get it even if you've got the money. The day of redemption is the day you take that slip back, present it, and get your watch. And brother, the Holy Spirit has sealed me till the day of redemption. The day of redemption is the day I die and go home to be with the Lord or the day Jesus Christ comes back and gets me. That's the day of redemption. And it says, I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until that day of redemption. That Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body. Brother, I'll tell you why. If I've been baptized into the body of Christ, that means that I've been immersed into His body by the Spirit of God. If I'm in the body of Christ, for me to get out of the body of Christ would mean to dismember and disfigure and to distort the body of Christ, which won't be done. Brother, God's body, Jesus' body, was messed with one time. It was slain one time. It was defigured one time. It was uh, crucified one time. And the body of Christ isn't going to be uh, mutilated anymore. Brother, He rose with a glorified body and He's got a spiritual body that is made up of all the born again believers in Christ Jesus. And once you're in that body, you don't get cut off. No amputees. Let me say this tonight. 
That Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Brother, I'll tell you what, when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came inside. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit came inside, and the body, that Bible now says that your body is the temple of God. This, this church is not the temple of God. Right. You know, you can take this church, turn it into a bar room, a house of prostitution, a hospital, anything you wanted to. And you know, uh, 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 I mean, God wouldn't wipe it off the face of the earth. But I'm saying to you tonight that you've got a body in which the Holy Spirit resides and He says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and if a man defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. Brother, you just go out here and you start that old life again. You start smoking them cigarettes. You start drinking that liquor. You start doing those drugs and you're defiling the temple of God and the Bible says, him will God destroy. Brother, there's been more than one person that I've met acquaintance with on the face of this earth that turned their back on the Lord Jesus Christ and they're dead tonight. I believe they're dead in heaven, but I don't believe God lets a man turn away from him and live like the devil and just continue on going down that road of ungodliness and sinfulness without him first reproving and then beating and chastising and then finally cutting them off and taking them on out of this world. I say there's a lot of people tonight that don't have assurance of their salvation because they're ignorant of the Word of God. Take your Bible and one last verse on this point. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Romans 8 verse 35 it says, Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I believe that tonight. Amen. Brother, I'll tell you what. You tell me that a man can lose his salvation. That's a rough passage of Scripture there. That verse starts out by saying, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And it winds up by saying, There's no separation from a person that's been uh, saved, uh, no separation from the love of Christ. Brother, I'm thankful tonight that God doesn't condemn me when I walk after the Spirit. It doesn't say that He won't condemn you if you walk after the flesh. There is condemnation if you walk after the flesh. You say, What's the condemnation? Verse 13. If you walk after the flesh, you shall die. You know, every place in the Bible that talks about condemnation, it doesn't mean damnation in hell. Right. And brother, that Bible says, if you uh, are walking in the Spirit, there is therefore now no condemnation. And brother, when you get saved, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. It says nothing. Not tribulation, not distress, not persecution, not famine, not nakedness, not peril, not sword, uh, not uh, angels, not death, not life, not principalities, not powers, not things present, not things to come, not height, not depth, not any other creature shall be able to separate you. You know, there's a lot of people tonight that don't have assurance of their salvation because they're ignorant of what God's Word has to say. And the last thing that I want to say to you tonight about assurance is this. There's grounds for assurance. There's grounds for having assurance of your salvation. Now, assurance is important. And there's some things that will cause you to lack that assurance. But then there's some ground that you can stand on that, brother, ought to cause you to go out of here tonight rejoicing in Jesus Christ, saying, How blessed assurance Jesus is mine. Be able to say, My beloved is mine and I am His. And one of the grounds of assurance of salvation tonight, or one of the things that's not a grounds of, a, of assurance tonight, is feelings. Feelings. That's not a grounds for assurance. I've talked to people and I say, well, have you ever been saved? And they say, well, I don't know, but one time I did this and I did that and I have feelings. Or I'll say, are you saved? And they say, well, I feel like I am. And I say, well, what about tomorrow? How about if you feel like you don't? Does that mean you're not? You know, give them something to think about. Think about that for a while. Uh, uh, feelings is not a ground for assurance. You say, why not? Because, for one thing, your feelings change. I've got a thing written in the front of my Bible. I read it every now and then. I've probably read it to you before. I'll read it to you again. It says this about feelings. It says, Feelings come and feelings go. And feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the Word of God and all else is worth believing. 
Though all my heart shall feel condemned for one of one small token, there is one greater than my heart. His word cannot be gro- broken. I will trust in God's unchanging word till soul and body sever. For though through all things, or though all things shall pass away, His word abides forever. Yeah. Brother, I'll tell you what, the grounds of assurance tonight is not feelings. And it's not feelings because your feelings are going to change. You might feel great tonight. I mean, you might have been coming to the revival meeting and maybe God did something to you and He twanged the strings of your heart and put a, a song in your mouth and you go out of here just sort of floating on the crowd, a cloud and, and uh, raising your hands and shouting hallelujah. Well, you don't do it in here, but maybe you do it in your car. I don't know. But brother, I'll tell you what. You might feel great this week and next week uh, the bills start rolling in and the wife starts jumping on your back. And brother, the employer starts getting on you and you miss a few church services and pretty soon the devil comes around to pay you a visit and says, hey, what about it, fellow? Maybe what you had a couple weeks ago in that revival meeting wasn't really real. (laughs) Brother, I'll tell you what. Feelings is not a grounds to base your salvation on because your feelings change. Not only that, but the devil can give you feeling. You say, oh, I don't believe that. I do. Boy, I believe the devil gives a a lot of people feelings. I believe the devil does all kinds of tricky supernatural things. I've seen him do tricky supernatural things. That Bible says, be not deceived. Uh, uh, Well, no, it says uh, over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let me get it in here. It says, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, and therefore his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Brother, don't think for a minute that the devil doesn't have supernatural power. He can transform himself into an angel of light and he can deceive. And there's a lot of people in this world today that the devil has given them a little feeling. He ran some goosebumps up and down their backbone. I mean, he knocked them down on the ground. They rolled around and they, they frothed at the mouth and their eyes rolled back in their head and they jumped up and down on the floor and Jim jumped up and ran around the church a few times hollering hallelujah and they think because of that they got saved. That's not salvation, friend. Brother, I'll tell you what, the devil's capable of doing that. Feelings. The devil can give them to you. And let me say this about feelings. It's not a very good grounds to base your salvation on because you don't base anything else on feelings. I mean, what if tomorrow you got up in the morning and the alarm went off and you push the alarm off and you say, eh, I don't feel like going to work today. I think I'll just lay here in a bed. And the wife says, hey man, get up. I don't feel like it. If you don't get up, you're not going to get any pay. I don't feel like it. Uh-uh. You go whether you feel like it or not. Amen? And if you don't base other things on feelings, and if you don't make other decisions according to your feelings, then why would you ever base salvation on feelings? A couple of weeks ago, I was laying in the bed. My, my, my wife said to me, you're going to have to go to the doctor. I said, I don't feel like it. <laughs> Running 103 fever, don't touch me, don't move me. I roll over, I feel sick in the stomach. The only trips I made was was from the bed to the bathroom. The bed to the bathroom, from the bathroom to the bed. I made it so many times that that became the theme of my life. I thought when I get better, I'm going to preach a message from the bathroom to the bed. (laughs) Amen. I mean, I'll tell you what, I didn't feel like doing anything. But you know, she got me up and got my clothes on me. Went down to the doctor's. Oh, that was an experience. We went in the doctor's office. I carried, you wouldn't believe this, but I carried a little plastic thing to throw up in, you know. That's how bad I felt. And here I was getting out of the car, walking like this, and sat down. I got into the doctor's office, and I sat right there, and the nurse said, what's wrong with him? I said, I'm sick. He <laughs> said, you look sick. I went into the doctor's office, and the doctor, he's a, he was an oriental, you know, and he came in and he said, now what's the matter with you? And I said, I'm going to die. <laughs> I said, I'm a sick man. <laughs> and he said, well, let me see. Open your mouth. Oh, no sore throat in your ear. No ear infection. He said, took the mom around my mouth. He says, oh, fever? Like that, you know, and then he starts thumping around. <laughs> I said, oh, man, don't, don't do that. He said, breathe deep. I went, I can't breathe deep. I'm going to pass out. Ah. I said, get me on the table. Get me on the table. I was getting dizzy. I laid down on the table and... And he said, okay, breathe. And I said, Doc, I can't breathe. I said, just leave me alone. And he said, well, breathe. And I go, okay. I said, is that enough? He said, yeah. 
No pneumonia. He said, you're all right. It's just a flu. Nothing we can do about that. <laughs> Amen. He gave me a prescription for cough tablets. And then he gave me a uh, some kind of a mycin tablet for... I don't know what that was for. And he says, if you don't get better by next week, come back and see me. We'll take you to the hospital. We x-ray you. I thought I might be dead by next week. Dumb doctors, why did I ever come? But I went. See, that was a decision that wasn't based on feeling. I didn't feel like going, but I knew I had to go. And brother, what I'm trying to say to you tonight is when it comes to something as important as your soul salvation, you better make sure that you don't base it upon feeling. Not only that, don't base it upon spiritual attainments. I'm not saved because of what I do for God. Amen. Brother, I was saved when I was a down and out, no good, filthy, rotten bum that deserved to go to hell. Amen. Brother, don't I don't think for a minute that preaching's helping me get to heaven. I got it all on November the 8th, 1966. Amen. Brother, don't you think for a minute because you live pretty good or you do pretty good or you've read your Bible through or that you're a member of a church or that you've come to some other spiritual uh, height in your life that that means you're going to get to heaven because, brother, salvation is not based on spiritual change. I'll tell you something else that's not based on. It's not based on conduct or character. There's a lot of people that are in hell tonight and they never drank, they never committed adultery, they never gambled, they probably never smoked, and they might not have ever cussed. But I'll tell you, as far as moral living and conduct and character is concerned, they had spotless character. Uh, there's a lot of people that are, have great character. I mean, they have great resistance and they can do, uh, they can live very clean, moral lives. But that doesn't get you to heaven. And don't ever base your salvation on conduct or character. Let me say last of all, there's one thing that you can base your salvation on, and that's this book. Now see, you can drive a peg in there. You can base your salvation on the Scriptures. One time, uh, Chapman, Wilbur Chapman came to Moody. And Moody asked him if he is saved. He said, well, I don't know. Moody opened a very simple verse of Scripture, John chapter 5, verse 24, read it over. And he said, do you believe that? And the man said, yes. He said, have you done that? And he said, yes, but. He said, wait a minute. What does God say? And after three times, each time Chapman said, but, Moody said, wait. Who are you doubting? God or yourself? And I say to you tonight, if you don't have assurance of your salvation after having done what the Word of God says do, then you're doubting you and you're doubting God. A fellow came one time, let me illustrate it this way, you didn't get the a, a fellow came one time and he said, he said, I thought I was saved, but then one day I got to thinking, maybe I didn't have the right kind of faith. That's a trick with that, you know that? Yeah. Maybe you didn't believe the right way. Maybe you didn't really have heart belief. And he said, I got to thinking that maybe I didn't have the right kind of faith. That maybe it really wasn't saving faith that I got. And I just thought I got saved. And the preacher said, listen, suppose you went to work every single day. And as you were going to work, you crossed a bridge. And the bridge crossed the span of water. And then one day somebody came to you and told you the bridge is weak and it's liable to collapse and you're liable to plunge to your death. He said, what would you do? Would you examine your faith in the bridge or would you go examine the bridge? Well, I'll tell you what. If you had any sense at all, you'd go check out the bridge. Amen? I mean, you've had the faith to go across it every single day on your way to work. And that's the way it is, brother. I'll tell you what, if the devil comes with doubts and say you didn't have the right kind of faith, don't examine your faith, go examine the bridge. And Jesus Christ is the bridge. And if you examine Him, I'll guarantee you, you'll walk away with assurance in your heart. Amen. Assurance in your heart. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24, and hereby we know that He abideth in us by the Spirit which He hath given us. The last thing I want to say is that you can have assurance of your salvation because of the witness of the Holy Spirit of God. 
It says that there's a witness inside of every believer and it's the witness of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is something inside me that bears witness with this book and bears witness with the Spirit of God that lets me know and gives me assurance that I am a child of God regardless of what the devil ever says to me and regardless of what anyone else ever says to me. Brother, I'll tell you what, I remember the first time that that witness ever testified to me. I was only saved two days. I'll tell you exactly how it happened. I went into a Bible class. I got saved on a Monday. On a Wednesday, I went into a Bible class down in Pensacola, Florida and heard Dr. Ruckman. My idea of Bible classes and of Bible teachers were a bunch of uh, scholars that have studied and were dry and didn't have anything to say, but I thought I would just go and listen to this man. And I started hearing stuff that I'd never heard before. This man had some authority that was bearing witness to something that was inside me. And I didn't know all about it then, but I knew something was going on inside. We were studying the book of Hebrews, and the book of Hebrews was heavy. It was whizzing over my head. At the end of that class, he was talking about Jesus Christ being the rock. And he went over to the Old Testament and showed how that in the Old Testament, when the children of God got to murmuring, that God told Moses, you smite the rock and water will come out. And Moses smote the rock and the water came out and the people drank and their thirst was quenched. And then the children of Israel got to murmuring again and God told Moses, Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses smote the rock. And he said, folks, listen, Jesus Christ is the rock. He said it was, he was smitten once when he laid down his life on Calvary. And he said, now all she has to do is speak to him to get a drink of living water. Amen. And boy, there was something inside me that said, that's what you did. That's what you did. And man, I'll tell you what, I don't know how other people walked out of that place, but I walked about two foot off the ground. I just sort of hovered out there. You say, why? The Spirit of God bore witness with my spirit. And brother, I say to you tonight that you ought to be able to go out of here and say Jesus is mine and I am His and it ought to be able to be based on the Word of God and you ought to have the Spirit of God within you to testify that you are a child of God. And if that doesn't exist in your life, then tonight what you need to do is just come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe the devil's been plaguing you with doubt. What you need to do is just come and say, Lord, I'm going to claim the promises. Because I believe this tonight. If you're a child of God, there's going to be something inside of you that says, you're saved. The devil comes around and says, no, you're not. There will be something in there that will say, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Tonight, I hope that Jesus is yours. And if He's not, He can be yours before you go to your car. He'll save anyone that will come to Him by faith. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, I pray that You'd take this simple message and just apply it to the hearts and lives of these folks that are here. God, maybe everyone here tonight saved. I don't know. Maybe there's not one person in here that has any doubt about their salvation or ever has any, has, has any doubt about their salvation. But Father, I know that if you tarry, that the devil is going to plague a lot of people in the future. And Father, in the days that lie ahead, when the devil, the adversary, comes around and tries to destroy faith, I pray that this message would ring back in their heart. And may they remember that Jesus is mine. God, tonight I'm thankful that I can say like Paul, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Lord, if there's someone in here tonight that doesn't know you, if they can't say, I know in whom I have believed. Father, if there's never been a time in their life that by faith they just simply came trusting you, if they're trusting in something else, outside of Jesus Christ tonight, I pray that you'd show it to them. May tonight be the night that they go away saying, Jesus is mine. Amen. Bless now on this invitation. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. What page are we saying? Amen.